Well, this is our 50th lesson in the book of Acts. We've been at this for a year. And the reason for this deliberate pace I ha uh, has, I hope, become quite apparent to you. We've taken many detours to carefully examine the explosive rise of trust in Yeshua as Messiah that was expressed mostly by the Jewish movement called the Way. Now, we've also examined Judaism and the state of Jewish society, both inside and outside of the Holy Land, in order to, be, to better understand the several Jewish Bible characters and their circumstances and what they mean by what they say. Don't you think that's kind of important? Because without doing that, we can totally misconstrue what Jehovah intends for us to learn. Chief among these Bible characters and decision makers is Paul whom the Lord has decided must go to Rome, the future seat of the Gentile Christian church. And this is in order to extend the reach of the gospel with an intention to appear before the emperor. Now, how such an improbable thing as a mere Jewish commoner gets an audience with Roman governors, perhaps even with the emperor, could ever happen this is what we're watching unfold as God orchestrates matters invisibly according to his will. We're going to start our lesson today with another one of those detours. <clears throat> now, as we continue with our study of Acts chapter 23, we find that Shaul, Paul, is once again under attack from fellow Jews who think he's become a traitor to Judaism, or to be more precise, a traitor to his Jewishness, to his Jewishness. Now, before we reread a few verses from chapter 23 of Acts, I want to point out that terms like Judaism and Jewishness, which out of necessity I often use, can be challenging to precisely define. I mean, drawing a distinction between those two terms is not as easy as it might seem because there's no single authority that can declare exactly what Judaism is and is not or what Jewishness is or is not. These are quite subjective terms that get reshaped as, as, as history unravels. Now, as an illustration, this is not unlike the issue of definitively asserting what the term Christian means. Something which on the surface ought not to be so difficult to wrap our arms around, but it is. Now, I suspect that if I asked each of you what a Christian is, I would actually get a slightly different answer. And if I went to the Middle East or to North Africa and I asked that same question, I'd get something else entirely. No doubt, all would begin with saying that a Christian's a follower of Christ. But then, you would qualify that with some caveats and some definitions that not all who call themselves Christians would agree with. For instance, can you be a Christian and not believe that Christ is God? Can you be a Christian and not believe in the virgin birth? Can you be a Christian and not believe that Christ is a Jew? Can you be a Christian and not celebrate Christmas and Easter? As it was and remains just like that in trying to deal with ancient Judaism as all the sects maintained the common belief that Jehovah was the God of Israel. But after that, there were many nuances and variations that led to, to several sects of Judaism being formed. Can you be a Jew and believe that other nations have legitimate gods? Can you be a Jew and not believe in the resurrection of the dead? Can you be a Jew and not be circumcised? 
And every bit as much in our time as with the ancient past, can you be a Jew and believe that Yeshua of Nazareth is the Messiah? One of the more difficult things to comprehend is that while it still applies in varying degrees in our time, in Bible times, religion was invariably but one element of how you defined your ethnicity. So, for instance, you would not identify yourself as a Canaanite without the proper genealogy, using the standard Canaanite clothing, wearing your hair in Canaanite fashion, living in homes built in a certain traditional Canaanite way, having culturally desired occupations while shunning others, and generally living a well-defined Canaanite lifestyle while worshiping the Canaanite pantheon of gods in the traditionally accepted way. Thus, when we apply this same principle to Jews, we see that the religion of the Jews, Judaism as it was eventually labeled, was merely one of several necessarily, necessary elements of one's life that served to identify you and qualify you as a Jew. Religion was only one part of what made a Jew a Jew. And there were several other parts. Generally speaking, remove or renounce any of these parts, and then your Jewishness would be questioned. So where did the religion of the Jews of the New Testament times, Judaism, come from? It was not taken exclusively from the Hebrew Bible. You'll never find the word synagogue or find their liturgical practices in the Old Testament. It doesn't exist there. Rather, Judaism was a new phenomenon. It was a product of the synagogue system. The synagogue system itself was rather new. As it arose as a man-made system which resulted from the unpleasant circumstances of the Babylonian exile of 600 BC that left the Jews living in foreign lands religiously adrift without a temple or a priesthood. Prior to their exile, it was the temple system, the temple system that had formed their religious structure. And it was the focal point of their religious life but now without that temple and priesthood, their religious structure was defunct. So the leaders among the exiled Jews devised an alternative system. And it differed somewhat from the temple and its purposes. A system that eventually came to be known as Judaism. Jews were from the tribe of Judah. Therefore, the term Judaism, the religion of Judah. Judaism incorporated many familiar elements of the original Torah divine system that depended on the temple. A system that at Mount Sinai, God had defined and he commanded that it be applied to all the 12 tribes of Israel. However, this newly modified Jewish religion dropped some of the elements of their former religion that seemed impractical, if not impossible, considering their situation, beginning with how and where worship occurred. Most importantly, Judaism added new practices to compensate for the lack of of the temple and the priesthood, and thus their inability to sacrifice to atone for their sins. But also because this modified religion was meant to apply primarily to the survivors of the Babylonian exile, Judah, the Jews, and not necessarily 
to their brother tribes that had long ago experienced their own exile from the, from, from the land, and they had never returned. Thus, especially as concerns Jews who freely chose to remain in foreign lands, we've got a name for them, diaspora Jews, instead of eventually returning to the Holy Land, what it meant to be Jewish was not necessarily the same when you compare it to what it meant before the exile. It changed. And for those fervent Jews who did return to the Holy Land, Jewishness, well, that meant something a little different than how the diaspora Jews viewed it. Thus, the Holy Land Jews and the Diaspora Jews were always at odds with one another over the question of, what's a Jew? Or to say it a bit differently, what constitutes a universally recognized and accepted Jewishness among people who identify themselves as Jews? Exactly what is it? Now, I began today's lesson by giving you this information because this, this that I just told you about, this is the bottom line cause of why Paul was being persecuted by the Judean Jews, the Holy Land Jews who lived in Judea, and especially by the ultra-religious and the ultra nationalistic sect of Jews called the Zealots. Christian Bible commentators debate endlessly over exactly which theological issues of Judaism or Christianity that had put Paul in such hot water. And they tend to make messianic theological issues as the reason that the Jewish people came against Paul. Now, while there is indeed one theological issue that is pointed out by Paul is especially contentious, and that is resurrection from the dead, that's the issue. This was actually an old and ongoing debate among Jews that had no special bearing on Paul or on believing Jews. This mob that wanted to kill Paul was anything but Jewish intellectuals. They weren't studied Torah scholars. They weren't ready to murder Paul over some arcane doctrinal differences. Rather, the issue was that these angry Judean Jews were not so much questioning Paul's religion as they were questioning his commitment to Jewishness. In fact, we find that as Lysias, the Roman commander, was questioning the crowd at the temple as to what it is that Paul had done to cause this riot, he became frustrated because they were all shouting something different. None of the answers was very coherent. Basically, the mob was just very upset about Paul in a general way. I mean, was Paul still a real Jew? Was Paul speaking and teaching against familiar, comfortable, traditional Jewishness? Might Paul be trying to redefine Jewishness, which was a never-ending matter among Jews anyway, was Paul turning his back on his Jewish heritage altogether and in process of becoming a Gentile and urging other Jews to cave in and do the same thing? So with that understanding as, a, as the backdrop for our story, let's reread the final few verses of Acts chapter 23. Acts chapter 23, we're going to start at verse 16. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, that will be page 1393. 
verse 16. But the son of Shaul's sister got wind of the planned ambush, and he went into the barracks, and he told Shaul. Now Shaul called one of the officers and said, Take this man up to the commander. He has something to tell him. So he took him, and he brought him to the commander and said, The prisoner Paul called me and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. And the commander took him by the hand and led him aside privately. And he asked, What is it you have to tell me? And he said, the Judeans have agreed to ask you tomorrow to bring Shaul down to the Sanhedrin on the pretext that they want to investigate his case more thoroughly. But don't let yourself be talked into it because more than 40 men are lying in wait for him. They've taken an oath neither to eat nor drink until they kill him. And they're ready now. They're only waiting for you to give your consent to this request. The commander let the young man go, cautioning him, don't tell anyone that you've reported this to me. Then he summoned two of the captains and he said, get 200 infantry soldiers ready to leave for Caesarea at 9 o'clock tonight. And 70 mounted cavalry and 200 spearmen. Also provide replacements for Shaul's horse when it gets tired and bring him through safely to Felix the governor. And the commander wrote the following letter from Claudius Lysias to His Excellency, Governor Felix. Greetings. This man was seized by the Judeans and he was about to be killed by them when I came on the scene with my troops and I rescued him. And after learning that he was a Roman citizen, I wanted to understand exactly what they were charging him with. So I brought him down to their Sanhedrin. Now, I found that he was charged in connection with questions of their Torah, but there was no charge deserving death or prison. But when I was informed of a plot against the man, I immediately sent him to you and also ordered his accusers to state their case against him before you. So the soldiers, following their orders, took Shaul during the night and brought him to Antipatris. Where they, turned, uh, they returned to the barracks after leaving the cavalry to go on with him. The cavalry took him to Caesarea, delivered the letter to the governor, and handed Paul over to them. The governor read the letter, and he asked what province he was from. And on learning he was from Cilicia, he said, I will give you a full hearing, after your accusers have also arrived. And he ordered him to be kept under guard in Herod's headquarters. Well, as we left off last time, Paul was back in his cell at the Antonia Fortress, as much for his own safety as anything else. And a, a, a mob of Judean Jews, along with some of the Sadducean members of the Sanhedrin, wanted to kill Paul, each for their own reasons. The Judean Jews, you see, had heard falsely that Paul was a traitor to Judaism and to Jewishness as he was seen regularly consorting with these hated Gentiles. Now, the reasons for the Sanhedrin's determination to rid themselves of him are less clear. But my conclusion is that it was because Paul had openly defied them. The first time was many years earlier. He was sent by the then high priest to arrest some Jesus sympathizers. Instead, Paul turned and became one of them. Second was because the Sadducees were aristocrats. And they didn't take it lightly when a common Jew developed his own following. Paul's popularity among so many diaspora Jews was viewed as a threat to their authority and to peace with Rome. But third, the Sanhedrin was convinced that Paul was teaching people to have no regard for the temple. The temple was Sadducee headquarters. And the high priest and most of the senior priests were Sadducees. And since the high priest was the chief justice of the Sanhedrin, and because the income from the temple was highly lucrative, this was a direct attack upon his territory and upon his personal finances. The Jewish sect of the Essens had already openly rebelled 
against the temple authorities, and subsequently many of its members moved to Qumran, out by the Dead Sea. They set up their own community, and they began training a replacement priesthood. That didn't sit too well with the priests. The head of the Sanhedrin, the high priest, didn't need someone else of substantial influence coming against him, creating a following, and maybe causing others to follow suit. So the most fanatical among the Judean Jews, probably the Zealots and the Sakari, about 40 of them, banded together and they formed a plan to draw the Roman guard out of their fortress, attack them, take Paul away from them, assassinating him on the spot. They took their plan to the high priest. He offered cooperation. But somehow Paul's young nephew heard of the plan. And he went to the Antonia Fortress and was allowed to tell Paul about it. Paul sent him to the Roman commander, Lysias, who believed the young man. I mean, after what Lysias had witnessed, he had no reason not to believe that a murder plot was underfoot. Now, since Paul was a Roman citizen, Lysias decided the only way he could fulfill his duty to protect him was to get him away from Jerusalem in this conspiracy and to do it fast. Besides, Lysias had a can of worms on his hands with this whole Paul issue, and he was more than happy to hand it off to his boss, Felix, to handle. Well, we find out in verse 22 that Lysias was taking no chances with these violent and committed Jews. So he put together a small army of 200 soldiers, 200 spearmen, and 70 mounted cavalry who could fend them off even if they doubled their numbers. But he also did the one thing that the ringleaders of the plot hadn't expected. The Roman army contingent took Paul from his cell under the cover of darkness, and they made a nighttime journey at what had to have been a forced march pace. Their destination was Caesarea Maritima on the Mediterranean seacoast. It was the official residence where Governor Felix resided, and so it was very well fortified. It had hundreds of Roman soldiers stationed there. It was about 60 miles from Jerusalem to Caesarea. However, the route they took went through Antipatris, which is today the Israeli city of Afek. Now, once they reached Antipatris, they were out of the reach of the assassination squad. So the foot soldiers weren't required to accompany their prisoner any further, and they were allowed to return home. Now, the distance from Jerusalem to Antipatris is 38 miles. And they covered that distance in the same amount of time that it normally takes to go 20 miles. In other words, they moved rapidly. Thus, the exhausted foot soldiers were relieved of duty, and Paul was accompanied the rest of the way only by Roman horsemen. Now, Lysias did not accompany his troops, and so he sent a letter of explanation with them to Felix, outlining the circumstances and the charges against Paul. Now, verse 25 divulges that Luke is giving us this letter to Felix. It says, in these terms... In other words, this is not a verbatim copy of the letter. Rather, somehow, Luke got the details of the letter, and that's what's been preserved for us. As a number of commentators have pointed out, there is no reason to doubt the content of this letter because it's true to the circumstances, the times, and even the Roman record about how things were done. Well, the letter begins with the customary flattery to a superior. Then it goes on to frame the situation in the most favorable possible light for Lysias. He discreetly omits that he had determined to flog this man. Matter of fact, he was just moments from doing so, and instead makes it sound as though he and his troops valiantly risked their own lives on a rescue mission to save Paul from the Jews. He goes on to explain that he took Paul to the Sanhedrin for questioning, but 
nothing they found against him broke any Roman law, and there seemed to be no broken Jewish law that rose to the consequence of the death penalty or even going to prison. And because Paul is a Roman citizen, Lysias explains that he is following proper protocol by sending Paul to the governor. And that he has ordered the accusers to go to Caesarea to explain the charges to Felix in person in a formal trial. Now Paul and the letter are promptly delivered to Felix, and the first thing Felix asks is where he's from. And the answer of Cilicia satisfied him. See, this was not a casual question. This is not like, hey man, how you doing? Where are you from? <laughs> it was usual that a suspect was tried by the provincial governor of the province where the suspect was from, not where the crime was committed. However, there was a hierarchy, you see, of Roman governors and procurators set up such that in this case, Felix outranked the governor of Cilicia, and so the case fell to him to try. This is why, in verse 35, Felix responds, I will give you a hearing. That is, he has accepted that this was the proper jurisdiction for the matter to be heard. The bad news is that Paul would be imprisoned at Herod's headquarters building called the Praetorium. The good news is that because he was a Roman citizen, because he had not yet had a trial, he would be guarded by the military, but it he wouldn't be staying in a prison cell. So his surroundings were much more tolerable than when he was being held at the Antonia Fortress in Jerusalem. Well, let's move on to Acts chapter 24. Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 24. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, we're starting on page 1394. Acts chapter 24. After five days, the Kohen Hanadol, that is the high priest, Hananiah, came down with some elders and a lawyer named Tertullus, and they, be, pre, they presented their case against Shaul to the governor. Now Shaul was called, and Tertullus began to make the charges. Felix, your excellency, it's because of you that we enjoy unbroken peace, and it is your foresight that has brought to this nation so many reforms in so many areas. It is with the utmost gratitude that we receive this. But in order not to take up too much of your time, I beg your indulgence to give us a brief hearing. Now we have found this man to be a pest. He's an agitator among all the Jews throughout the world. He's a ringleader of the sect of the Natsuatim. He even tried to profane the temple, but we arrested him. Now, by questioning this man yourself, you'll be able to learn all about the things of which we are accusing him. The Judeans also joined in the accusation and alleged that these were the facts. Well, when the governor motioned for Paul to speak, he replied, I know that you've been a judge over this nation for a number of years, so I'm glad to make my defense. Now, as you can verify for yourself, it's not been more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem, and neither in the temple nor in the synagogues, nor anywhere else in the city did they find me arguing with anyone or collecting a crowd. Nor can they give any proof of the things of which they're accusing me, but this I do admit to you. I worship the God of our fathers in accordance with the way which they call a sect. I continue to believe everything that accords with the Torah, everything written in the prophets. And I continue to have a hope in God, which they too accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the unrighteous. Indeed, it is because of this that I make a point of always having a clear conscience in the sight of both God and man. Well, after an absence of several years, I came to Jerusalem to bring a charitable gift to my nation and to offer sacrifices. It was in connection with the latter that they found me in the temple. I had been ceremonially, ceremonially purified. I was not with a crowd. I was not causing a disturbance. But some Jews from the province of Asia, 
they ought to be here before you to make a charge if they have anything against me. Or else, let these men themselves say what crime they found me guilty of when I stood in front of the sand and drink. Other than this one thing which I shouted out when I was standing among them, I am on trial before you today because I believe in the resurrection of the dead. But Felix, who had rather detailed knowledge of things connected with the way, put them off saying, when Lysias the commander comes down, I will decide your case. He ordered the captain to keep Shaul in custody, but to let him have considerable liberty and not prevent any of his friends from taking care of his needs. Well, after some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. He sent for Shaul and listened to him as he spoke about trusting in the Messiah, Yeshua. But when Shaul began to discuss righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix became frightened. And he said, for the time being, go away. I'll send for you when I get a chance. At the same time, he hoped that Paul would offer him a bribe. So he sent for him rather often. He kept talking with him. After two years, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. But because Felix wanted to grant the Judeans a favor, he left Charles, Shaul still a prisoner. Now we'll take a few side roads as we journey through this chapter because it gives me a good opportunity to pass along some helpful information that will aid you in studying the New Testament in general and in understanding the times in a practical way. Verse 1 explains that the high priest Hananiah, Ananias, made the trip to Caesarea along with some elders, likely Sanhedrin members, and also with what most Bibles will say was an attorney or a lawyer named Tertullus. Well, it was five days after Paul arrived before this contingent of prosecutors showed up and the trial could begin. Now, it's quite misleading to characterize Tertullus as a lawyer because the Greek says he was a rhetor, the word from which we get the English term rhetoric. The, the uh, King James Version Bible translates the term to mean orator, and that is much closer to reality. Within the Roman legal system, you see, his job was not to be a legal expert, but rather he was to present a formal legal case to the judge, in this case that judge was Felix, and the proper protocol, complete with lavish praise, heaped upon the judge. See, there were certain people trained and skilled in oratory, which was a much valued occupation in the Roman culture. They were hired for this purpose, as the lofty vocabulary gave the proceeding they felt much more gravitas. And especially if the judge were someone as distinguished and highly placed as a provincial governor, the judge would have been greatly offended. And if, a, if an approved rhetor had not shown up to set the stage with all of his flowery words, it was simply the rhetorical fashion of the time. Nothing more, nothing less. Although we can't be entirely certain, it's likely that Tertullus was Jewish, a Hellenistic Jew. Now, Tertullus <laughs> was a Latin name. Latin and Greek were the languages of the Roman Empire. But this isn't proof of a man's ethnicity. Many Jews the Latin and Greek names. Now, that said, because Hananiah the high priest was a Sadducee and he was a wealthy aristocrat, and because the high priest was an office appointed by the Romans once the wheels of justice had been properly lubricated, then there was a close and desired relationship established mostly monetary, between the high priest and the Roman government. So it's not out of the question. Could be that Tertullus could have been a Gentile rhetor. Now the high priest was by now, and had been this way for a hundred years, a figurehead position of prestige that was largely ceremonial. Mostly 
The high priest duties involved Shabbat, the seven biblical festivals, going into the Holy of Holies once per year on Yom Kippur, and announcing the new moons. Now, as we can imagine, he was not a Torah expert, even though the Sadducees claimed that they followed only the biblical Torah and they shunned the traditions that were championed by the Pharisees. Although I've covered it before, it would be good to repeat it. Since the 4th century B.C., before Christ, and all throughout the New Testament times, there were dual and competing religious institutions in existence for Jews. The temple and its priesthood, led by the high priest, versus the synagogue system and its leadership. These two systems were rivals in many ways, but they weren't enemies. The synagogue recognized the authority of the temple when it came to the rituals that according to the law of Moses could occur only at the temple. And they acknowledged the role of the priests in ceremonies that the Torah clearly required. The temple acknowledged that the temple system existed and that nearly every living Jew attended one, but that's about it. The synagogue was an unpleasant reality for them, but one they could not hope to change. So they found ways to coexist with it. Now one of the most important original tasks of the temple priests, and this is as commanded by God, was to teach the people God's biblical Torah, and then to enforce it. All this within the Hebrew community. But since the rebuilding of the temple by Nehemiah at the end of the Babylonian exile, temple activities became mostly about ritual and ceremony and less about teaching God's word and enforcing it. Part of the reason for this was because the vast majority of Jews now lived in the foreign lands of the diaspora, far away from the reach of the temple that was in Jerusalem. So the, ex the experience, you see, of the Jewish masses with their Jewish religion occurred where? Primarily in their synagogues. And these were led by non-priests. And synagogues were not under the authority of the temple or of the high priest. In fact, most synagogues, especially at first, were independent from one another, like with local community churches in rural areas in the USA. A locally elected leadership usually oversaw the, the, the town synagogue. But they had no official connection with the temple. And while there was no sacrificing in synagogues, and the typical God-ordained temple functions and celebrations on the various holy days still happened only at the temple, sheer practicality dictated that whatever teaching and enforcement that the average diaspora Jew received was obtained in the synagogue. Because it was local or at least it was relatively nearby. So as a consequence of the exile and of the extended time during which there was no temple and there was no operating priesthood to teach and, and enforce the biblical Torah, the laws of Moses, many new religious theories about sin and atonement and ritual cleanness and and how to remedy violations and impurity had been created by the synagogue authorities. These rulings came to be known as the traditions of the elders. Elders were local synagogue leaders who were usually not Torah experts. And more often than not, they were also not Levites, the tribe of priests, but rather they were just respected civic leaders. So pragmatism and local circumstances played a significant role in what the elders decided to create as rules and as laws 
for the local Jewish community to live by, and how to conduct synagogue worship services. It was during this same era that a synagogue tradition arose that Jews should assemble in communal worship one day per week on Shabbat. Such a communal meeting on Shabbat had never existed prior to the time of the Babylonian exile. Never existed. Shabbat simply amounted before then to the general Jewish population ceasing their normal labors for 24 hours. All ceremonial activity, all ritual for Shabbat was the province of the priests. So it was performed only at the temple. The population wasn't involved. And as the decades and then the centuries rolled by, these rulings and traditions created by the synagogue authorities became the unquestioned doctrines and practices for the synagogue. And it also dictated the lifestyles and the religious activities for the masses of common Jews, especially for those living out in the diaspora. For a very long time, the Jews that had moved back to the Holy Land tended to show a bit more loyalty and connection to the temple and the priesthood. But by Jesus' day, the synagogue overtook the temple as the dominant religious institution of the Holy Land, as well as on the diaspora. This showed up primarily in that the original laws of Moses gave way to Halakha, Jewish law. And Jewish law was a fusion of the laws of Moses, traditions of the elders, and ancient Jewish cultural customs. So, as we turn now to our biblical story of Paul standing trial before Felix, we read about the overwhelming flattery that Tertullus heaps upon the governor. <coughs> he says that great peace is being enjoyed on account of Felix, meaning peace between the Jews and the Romans, and that Felix is apparently working hard to keep improving living conditions for the residents of Judea. None of this is true. <laughs> Felix was the worst sort of governor. He was greedy. He was cruel. He was ruthless. He cared only to enrich himself. He was part of what is called the equestrian class of Roman rulers. That is, see, the aristocracy of Roman society had two tiers. The highest was the senatorial class. The lower of the two aristocratic classes was called the equestrian class. Both classes were wealthy. Once a person became a senator, they became part of the uppermost class. Sons of senators remained as part of the equestrian class until and unless they became a senator. Now, Antonius Felix was not a senator. He was a freedman who had belonged to the imperial family. The retired high priest Jonathan, another wealthy man who had literally purchased his position as high priest, had used his influence to help Governor Felix obtain the, gov uh, obtain the governor position from Cuminus, who had come into disfavor over how he mishandled some riots between Jews and Samaritans. Felix had very good political connections of his own, you see, because he was related to Emperor Claudius through his marriage to the daughter of Antony and Cleopatra. Later, Felix also married the youngest daughter of Herod Agrippa. This guy knew how to get in something inside here. This was a Jewish girl that we meet in this chapter named Drusilla. But this marriage was quite controversial, you see, because Drusilla was already betrothed to the king of Amesis, a fellow named Azizus, when Felix was smitten by her and he somehow managed to woo her away from Azizus, causing a lot of trouble. This Roman rather the Roman politician and historian Tacitus 
records that Felix was not well regarded. Rather, he practiced, and this is a quote, every kind of cruelty and lust, wielding the power of the king with all the instincts of a slave. Not a very popular man. Felix was hard on the Jewish people. He behaved with severity towards them. And this resulted in further acts of rebellion by the Jews. And since the Romans valued stability and peace above all, this eventually resulted in Felix being removed from his position, and he was replaced by Festus, who we will read about in Acts chapter 25. Now, Paul is quite aware of Felix and his history, so he will tread cautiously when it's his turn to respond to the accusations put forward by Tertullus. So beginning in verse 2, we have the case against Paul set out from the worldview of the high priest. And as I mentioned at the outset of today's lesson, we're hard-pressed to find anything of a theological nature that Paul is accused of violating. Rather, the accusation is from the mindset of a wealthy, aristocratic high priest who doesn't think anyone of a lower class should ever disagree with him to his face nor cause him any bother. Thus, Tertullus explains in verse 5 that generally speaking, Paul is just a pest. He foments uprisings among Jews, he said, throughout the entire world. And he is the ringleader of a sect of Jews called the Nazaretim. Finally, he says that Paul tried to profane the temple. But fortunately, they were able to stop him before he did. Now, how he went about trying to profane the temple is never stated. So according to Tertullus, Paul never actually profaned the temple. He just tried to, but he didn't succeed. Now, what would have caught Governor Felix's ear, you see, were the political issues that were set for him? What would he care about mundane matters of Jewish religious law? Essentially, the first couple of charges are that Paul causes trouble. And he thwarts every sincere effort of the Sanhedrin and the Romans to maintain peace. And Tertullus then cleverly ties this allegation to Paul being a ringleader. Now, this is a term that was used for criminal activity. Of a revolutionary sect of Jews called the Nazretim. So the implication against Paul is similar to the charge leveled against his master, Yeshua. He's trying to start a rebellion to overthrow Roman rule. Now for the Jewish high priest to bring these charges of attempted sedition by a fellow Jew to a Roman occupier was beyond the pale. Essentially, Hananiah was playing the role of informer to the enemy. Rome. And while the Torah doesn't have anything directly to say about such an activity, Halakha does. And the general attitude is that a Jew who turns in another Jew to face a Gentile court essentially causes Jewish law to be made inferior to Gentile law. In the Talmud, Tractate Sanhedrin 26, it states that any Jew who would turn in another Jew to Gentile authorities was considered to have reviled, blasphemed, and rebelled against the laws of Moses. If convicted, this would bring on the death penalty of the informer. The Essens, who considered the high priesthood corrupt and wicked and an enemy of God and the people, wrote the following in their temple scroll that was found at Qumran. If a man, a Jew, passes on information against his people, or he betrays his people to a foreign nation, or he does evil against his people, you shall hang him on a tree and he will die. I have little doubt that that comment was aimed directly at the much reviled high priest's office due to their very public attachment and notoriously cozy relationship with the Roman government, who appointed them to their lucrative position in the first place. 
This is the second time within a week that poor Paul has faced the accusation of Hananya, the high priest. But you know what? By now he's had plenty of time to think about how to respond. This becomes evident in his rather eloquent rebuttal to these lucrative charges, uh, lucrative, lucrous charges. Pardon me. That begins in verse 10, and we'll examine that next time.